why do the untouchables live outside the village? Are the untouchables broken men? Are there parallel cases? How did separate settlements for broken men disappear elsewhere? Why do the untouchables live outside the village? That the untouchables live outside the village is so notorious a fact that it must be taken to be within the cognizance even of those whose knowledge about them is not very profound. Yet nobody has thought that this was a serious question calling for satisfactory answer. How did the untouchables come to live outside the village? Were they declared to be untouchables first and then deported out of the village and made to live outside? Or were they from the very beginning living outside the village and were subsequently declared to be untouchables? If the answer is that they were living outside the village from the very beginning, there arises a further question, namely, what can be the reason for it? As the question of the separate settlement of the untouchables has never been raised before, naturally there exists no theory as to how the untouchables came to live outside the village. There is, of course, the view of the Hindu Shastras, and if one wants to dignify it by calling it a theory, one may do so. The Shastras, of course, say that the Antyajas should live and have their abode outside the village. For instance, Manu says, 10.51, But the dwelling of the Chandalas and the Shwapakas shall be outside the village. They must be made upper patras and their wealth shall be dogs and donkeys. 10.52 Their dress shall be the garments of the dead. They shall eat their food from broken dishes. Black iron shall be their ornaments and they must always wander from place to place. 10.53 A man who fulfills a religious duty shall not seek intercourse with them. Their transactions shall be among themselves and their marriages with their equals. 10.54 Their food shall be given to them by others than an Aryan giver in a broken dish. At night they shall not walk about in village and in towns. 10.55 By day they may go about for the purpose of their work, distinguished by marks at king's command, and they shall carry out the corpses of persons who have no relatives that is a settled rule. 10.56 By the king's order, they shall always execute the criminals in accordance with the law, and they shall take for themselves the clothes, the beds, and the ornaments of such criminals. Reference over. But what conclusion can one draw from these statements of the Shastras? They are capable of double interpretation. When the Shastras say, that the untouchables should stay outside the village, they may be purporting to say no more than that the untouchables should stay where they have been staying, that is, outside the village. This is one interpretation. The second interpretation is that those who are declared untouchables should not be allowed to stay inside the village, but should be required to go out of the village and live outside. Following up the alternate interpretations of the Shastras, there are two different possibilities which call for consideration. One is that the untouchability has nothing to do with the untouchables living outside the village. From the very beginning, they lived outside the village. Thereafter, when the stigma of untouchability fell upon them, they were prohibited from coming to live inside the village. The other possibility is that untouchability has everything to do with the untouchables living outside the village. In other words, the untouchables originally lived inside the village and that thereafter, when the stigma of untouchability fell on them, they were forced to vacate and live outside the village. Which of the two possibilities is more acceptable? The second possibility is on the face of it absurd and Fantastic! One argument is quite enough to expose its absurdity. The phenomena we are discussing is not confined to a single village or single area. It exists all over India. The transplantation of the untouchables from within, the village to outside the village, is a vast operation. How, 
and who could have carried on an operation of such colossal dimension? It could not have been carried out except by the command of an emperor having his sway over the whole of India. Even to him such a transplantation would have been impossible. But possible and impossible, it can only be the work of an emperor. Who is the emperor to whom the credit or discredit of this task can be assigned? Obviously, India had no emperor to perform this task. If there was no emperor to do the transplantation, then the second possibility must be abandoned. That those who are called untouchables lived outside the village from the very beginning even before they became untouchables and that they continued to live outside the village because of the supervention of untouchability at a later stage is the only possibility worth consideration. But this raises a very difficult question. Why did they live outside the village? What made them or force them to do so? The answer is that having regard to the factors which are known to students of sociology to have influenced the transformation of primitive society into modern society all over the world, it is only natural to suppose that the untouchables should have from the beginning lived outside the village. Not many will realize why this is natural without some explanation of the factors which have affected the condition of primitive society into modern society. For a clear understanding of the matter, it is necessary to bear in mind that modern society differs from primitive society in two respects. Primitive society consisted of nomadic communities while modern society consists of settled communities. Secondly, Primitive society consisted of tribal communities based on blood relationship. Modern society consists of local communities based on territorial affiliations. In other words, there are two lines of evolution along which primitive society has proceeded before it became transformed into modern society. One line of evolution has led the primitive society to become a territorial community from being a tribal community. There can be no doubt that such a change has taken place. Clear traces of the change are to be seen in the official style of kings. Take the style of the English kings. King John was the first to call himself the King of England. His predecessors commonly called themselves Kings of the English. The former represent a territorial community. The latter represent a tribal community. England was once the country which Englishmen inhabited. Englishmen are now the people who inhabit England. The same transformation can be seen to have taken place in the style of the French kings who were once called kings of the Franks and later as kings of France. The second line of evolution had led primitive society to become a settled community instead of the nomadic community which it was. Here again, the change is so definite and so impressive that no illustration is required to convince anybody of its reality. For the purpose in hand, all we need is to confine ourselves to a consideration of the second line of evolution. How did primitive society become a settled community? The story of how primitive society became a settled community is too long to be detailed in a chapter much too long to be compressed in a section thereof. It is enough to note two things. The first thing to understand is what made primitive society give up its nomadic life and secondly, what happened in the transition from nomadic to settled life. Primitive society was no doubt nomadic, but it was nomadic not because of any migratory instinct, nor was it due to any mental trait peculiar to it. It was the result of the fact that the earliest form of the wealth held by primitive society was cattle. Primitive society was migratory because its wealth, namely the cattle, was migratory. Cattle went after new pastures. Primitive society, by reason of its love for cattle, therefore went wherever its cattle carried it. Primitive society became fixed in its abode, in other words, became a settled community, when a new species of wealth was discovered. This new species of wealth was land. This happened when primitive society learned the art of farming and of cultivating land. Wealth became fixed at one place when it changed 
its form from cattle to land. With this change, primitive society also became settled at the same place. This explains why primitive society was at one time nomadic and what led it to take to settle life. The next thing is to note the events that have happened when primitive society was on the road to becoming a settled society. The problems which faced primitive society in its transition from nomadic life to settled life were mainly two. One confronted the settled community, the other confronted the broken men. The problem that confronted the settled community was that of its defense against the nomadic tribes. The problem which confronted the broken men was that of the protection and shelter. It may be desirable to elucidate how and why these problems arose. For an understanding of the problem which confronted the settled tribes, it is necessary to bear in mind the following facts. All tribes did not take to settle life at one and the same time. Some became settled and some remained nomadic. The second thing to remember is that the tribes were never at peace with one another. They were always at war. When all tribes were in a nomadic state, the chief causes for intra-tribal warfare were 1. Stealing cattle 2. Stealing women and 3. Stealthily grazing of cattle in the pastures belonging to other tribes. When some tribes became settled, the tribes that remained nomadic found it more advantageous to concentrate their fight against the settled tribes. It was more paying than a war against other nomadic tribes. The nomadic tribes had come to realize that the settled tribes were doubly wealthy. Like the nomadic tribes, they had cattle. But in addition to cattle, they had corn, which the nomadic tribes had not, and which they greatly coveted. The nomadic tribes systematically organized raids on the settled tribes with the object of stealing the wealth belonging to the settled tribes. The third fact is that the settled tribes were greatly handicapped in defending themselves against these raiders. Being engaged in more gainful occupation, the settled tribes could not always convert their plows into swords, nor could they leave their homes and go in pursuit of the raiding tribes. There is nothing strange in this. History shows that peoples with civilization but no means of defense are not able to withstand the attacks of the barbarians. This explains how and why during the transition period the settled tribes were faced with the problem of their defense. How the problem of the broken men arose is not difficult to understand. It is the result of the continuous tribal warfare which was the normal life of the tribes in their primitive condition. In a tribal war, it often happened that a tribe, instead of being completely annihilated, was defeated and routed. In many cases, a defeated tribe became broken into bits. As a consequence of this, there always existed in primitive times a floating population consisting of groups of broken tribesmen roaming in all directions. To understand what gave rise to the problem of the broken men, it is necessary to realize that primitive society was fundamentally tribal in its organization. That primitive society was fundamentally tribal meant two things. Firstly, every individual in primitive society belonged to a tribe. Nay, he must belong to the tribe. Outside the tribe, no individual had any existence. He could have none. Secondly, tribal organization being based on common blood and common kinship. An individual born in one tribe could not join another tribe and become a member of it. The broken men had, therefore, to live as stray individuals. In primitive society, where tribe was fighting against tribe, a stray collection of broken men was always in danger of being attacked. They did not know where to go for shelter. They did not know who would attack them and to whom they could go for protection. That is why shelter and protection became the problem of the broken men. The foregoing summary of the evolution of primitive society shows that there was a time in the life of primitive society when there existed two groups. One group consisting of settled tribes faced with the problem of finding a body of men 
who would do the work of watch and ward against the raiders belonging to nomadic tribes and the other group consisting of broken men from defeated tribes with the problem of finding patrons who would give them food and shelter. The next question is, how did these two groups solve their problems? Although we have no written text of a contract coming down to us from antiquity, we can say that the two struck a bargain whereby the broken men agreed to do the work of watch and ward for the settled tribes and the settled tribes agreed to give them food and shelter. Indeed, it would have been unnatural if such an arrangement had not been made between the two, especially when the interest of the one required the cooperation of the other. One difficulty, however, must have arisen in the completion of the bargain, that of shelter. Where were the broken men to live? In the midst of the settled community or outside the settled community? In deciding this question, two considerations must have played a decisive part. One consideration is that of blood relationship, the second consideration is that of strategy. According to primitive notions, only persons of the same tribe, that is of the same blood, could live together. An alien could not be admitted inside the area occupied by the homesteads belonging to the tribe. The broken men were aliens, they belonged to a tribe which was different from the settled tribe. That being so, they could not be permitted to live in the midst of the settled tribe. From the strategic point of view also, it was desirable that these broken men should live on the border of the village so as to meet the raids of the hostile tribes. Both these considerations were decisive in favor of placing their quarters outside the village. We can now return to the main question, namely, why do the untouchables live outside the village? The answer to the question can be sought along the lines indicated above. The same processes must have taken place in India when the Hindu society was passing from nomadic life to the life of a settled village community. There must have been in primitive Hindu society settled tribes and broken men. The settled tribes founded the village and formed the village community and the broken men lived in separate quarters outside the village for the reason that they belonged to a different tribe and therefore to different blood. To put it definitely, the untouchables were originally only broken men. It is because they were broken men that they lived outside the village. This explains why it is natural to suppose that the untouchables from the very beginning lived outside and that untouchability has nothing to do with their living outside the village. The theory is so novel that critics may not feel satisfied without further questioning. They will ask, 1. Is there any factual evidence to suggest that the untouchables are broken men? 2. Is there evidence that the process of settlement suggested above has actually taken place in any country? 3. If broken men living outside the village is a universal feature of all societies, how is it that the separate quarters of the broken men have disappeared outside India but not in India. Chapter 4 Are the Untouchables Broken Men? To the question, are the untouchables in their origin only broken men? My answer is in the affirmative. An affirmative answer is bound to be followed by a call for evidence. Direct evidence on this issue could be had if the totems of the touchables and the untouchables in the Hindu villages had been studied. Unfortunately, the study of the totemic organization of the Hindus and the untouchables has not yet been undertaken by students of anthropology. When such data is collected, it would enable us to give a decisive opinion on the question raised in this chapter. For the present, I am satisfied from such inquiries as I have made that the totems of the untouchables of a particular village differ from the totems of the Hindus of the village. Difference in totems between Hindus and untouchables would be the best evidence in support of the thesis that the untouchables are broken men belonging to a different tribe from the tribe comprising the village community. It may however be admitted that such direct evidence as has a bearing on the question remains to be collected. But facts have survived 
which serve as pointers and from which it can be said that the untouchables were broken men. There are two sets of such evidentiary facts. One set of facts comprise the names Antya, Antyaja and Antyavasin, given to certain communities by the Hindu Shastras. They have come down from very ancient past. Why were these names used to indicate a certain class of people? There seem to be some meaning behind these terms. The words are undoubtedly derivative. They are derived from the root anta. What does the word anta mean? Hindus learned in the Shastras argue that it means one who is born last. And as the untouchable, according to the Hindu order of divine creation, is held to be born last. The word antya means an untouchable. The argument is absurd and does not accord with the Hindu theory of the order of creation. According to it, it is the Shudra who is born last. The untouchable is outside the scheme of creation. The Shudra is Savarna, as against him the untouchable is Avarna, that is outside the Varna system. The Hindu theory of priority in creation does not and cannot apply to the untouchable. In my view, the word Antya means not end of creation, but end of the village. It is a name given to those people who lived on the outskirts of the village. The word Antya has therefore a survival value. It tells us that there was a time when some people lived inside the village and some lived outside the village and that those who lived outside the village, that is on the Antya of the village, were called Antyaja. The second set of facts which shows that the untouchables were broken men relates to the position of a community called the Mahars. The Mahar community is a principal untouchable community in Maharashtra. It is the single largest untouchable community found in Maharashtra. The following facts showing the relations between the Mahars and the touchable Hindus are worthy of note. 1. The Mahars are to be found in every village. 2. Every village in Maharashtra has a wall and the Mahars have their quarters outside the wall. 3. The Mahars by turn do the duty of watch and ward on behalf of the village. And 4. The Mahars claim 52 rights against the Hindu villagers. Among these 52 rights, the most important are a. The right to collect food from the villagers b. The right to collect corn from each villager at the harvest season and c. The right to appropriate the dead animal belonging to the villagers. The evidence arising from the position of the Mahars is of course confined to Maharashtra. Whether similar cases are to be found in other parts of India has yet to be investigated. But if the Mahar's case can be taken as typical of the untouchables throughout India, it will be accepted that there was a stage in the history of India when broken men belonging to other tribes came to the settled tribes and made a bargain whereby the broken men were allowed to settle on the border of the village, were required to do certain duties and in return were given certain rights. The Mahars have a tradition that the 52 rights claimed by them against the villagers were given to them by the Muslim kings of Bedar. This can only mean that these rights were very ancient and that the kings of Bedar only confirmed them. These facts, although meager, do furnish some evidence in support of the theory that the untouchables lived outside the village from the very beginning. They were not deported and made to live outside the village because they were declared untouchables. They lived outside the village from the beginning because they were broken men who belonged to a tribe different from the one to which the settled tribe belonged. The difficulty in accepting this explanation arises largely from the notion that the untouchables were always untouchables. This difficulty will vanish if it is borne in mind that there was a time when the ancestors of the present-day untouchables were not untouchables vis-à-vis -vis the villagers but were merely broken men, no more and no less, and the only difference between them and the villagers was that they belonged to different tribes. Chapter 5 Are there parallel cases? Are there any cases known to history of broken men living outside the village? To this question, 
it is possible to give an affirmative answer. Fortunately for us, we have two reported cases which show that what is said to have occurred in India particularly has also actually occurred elsewhere. The countries wherein such a development has actually been reported to have taken place are Ireland and Wales. The organization of the Irish village in primitive times can be seen from the Brehon laws of Ireland. Some idea of it, as revealed in these laws, may be obtained from the summary given by Sir Henry Maine, reference to his book, Early History of Institutions, Lecture H.I., page 92 to 93, says Sir Henry Maine. Quotation begins, the Brehan law discloses a stage when the tribe has long been settled in all probability upon the tribal territory. It is of sufficient size and importance to constitute a political unit and possibly at its apex is one of the numerous chieftain whom the Irish records call kings. The primary assumption is that the whole of the tribal territory belongs to the whole of the tribe, but in fact large portions of it have been permanently appropriated to minor bodies of tribesmen. A part is allotted in special way to the chief as appurtenant to his office and descends from chief to chief according to a special rule of succession. Other portions are occupied by fragments of the tribe, some of which are under minor chiefs, while others, though not strictly ruled by a chief, have somebody of noble class to act as their representative. All the unappropriated tribe lands are in a more special way the property of the tribe as a whole and no portion can theoretically be subjected to more than a temporary occupation. Such occupations are however frequent and among the holders of tribe land on these terms are group of men calling themselves tribesmen but being in reality associations formed by contract chiefly for the purpose of pasturing cattle. Much of the common tribe land is not occupied to all, but constitutes, to use the English expression, the waste of the tribe. Still this waste is constantly brought under tillage or permanent pasture by settlements of tribesmen, and upon it cultivators and servile states are permitted to squat, particularly towards the border. It is part of the territory over which the authority of the chief tends steadily to increase, and here it is that he settles his fuidha or stranger, that is tenants, a very important class, the outlaws and broken men from other tribes who come to him for protection and who are only connected with their new tribe by their dependence on his chief and through the responsibility which he incurs for them. Quotation over. Who were the Fuidhas? According to Sir Henry Maine, the Fuidhas were reference taken from his book, The Tribal System in Wales, page number 9. Quotation begins. Strangers or fugitives from other territories, men in fact who had broken the original tribal bond which gave them a place in the community and who had to obtain and then as best they might in a new tribe and new place. Society was violently disordered. The result was probably to fill the country with broken men and such men could only find a home and protection by becoming Fuidha tenants. The Fuidha was not a tribesman but an alien. In all societies, cemented together by kinship, the position of the person who has lost or broken the bond of union is always extraordinarily miserable. He has not only lost his natural place in them, but they have no room for him anywhere else. Quotation over. Section 2. Now as to Wales. The organization of the Welsh village in primitive times is described by Mr. Seabom. Reference taken from his book, The Tribal System in Wales, page number 9. According to Mr. Seabom, a village in Wales was a collection of homesteads. The homesteads were separated into two groups, the homesteads of the free tenants and the homesteads of the unfree tenants. Mr. Seabom says that this separation in habitation was a common feature of the primitive village in Wales. Why were these unfree tenants made to live in a separate and detached place? The reason for this separation 
is explained by Mr. Seabom in these terms. Reference taken from IBID, page number 54 to 55. Quotation begins. At first sight, there is a great confusion in the class of men mentioned in the ancient Welsh laws of tribesmen, Euclor Briar and Innate Bonidings, of non-tribesmen, Talogo, Elet, Altude, etc. The confusion vanishes only when the principle underlying the constitution of tribal society is grasped, and this principle would apparently be a very simple one if could be freed from the complications of conquest and permanent settlement of land from the inroads of foreign law, custom and nomenclature. To begin with, there can be little doubt that the ruling principle underlying the structure of tribal society was that of blood relationship among the free tribesmen. No one who did not belong to a kindred could be a member of the tribe, which was in fact a bundle of Welsh kindred. Broadly then, under the Welsh tribal system, there were two classes, those of Cimeric blood and those who were stranger in blood. There was a deep, if not unpassable, gulf between these two classes, quite apart from any question of land or of conquest. It was a division in blood, and it soon became apparent that the tenacity with which the distinction was maintained was at once one of the strong distinctive marks of the tribal system and one of the main secrets of its strength. Quotation over. Section 3. This description of the organization of the Irish and the Welsh villages in the primitive times leave no doubt that the case of the untouchables of India is not the only case of people living outside the village. It proves that in it was exhibited a universal phenomena and was marked by these features. 1. That in primitive times, the village settlement consisted of two parts. One part occupied by the community belonging to one tribe and another part occupied by the broken men of different tribes. 2. The part of the settlement occupied by the tribal community was regarded as the village proper. The broken men lived in the outskirts of the village. 3. The reason why the broken men lived outside the village was because they were aliens and did not belong to the tribal community. The analogy between the untouchables of India and the Fuidhurs of Ireland and the Altudes of Wales is complete. The untouchables lived outside the village for the same reason for which the Fuidhurs and Altudes had to live outside the village in Ireland and Wales. It is therefore clear that what is said about the untouchables on the issue of their living outside the village is not without a parallel elsewhere. Chapter 6 How did separate settlements for broken men disappear elsewhere? That the Fuidhurs of Ireland and the Altudes of Wales were broken men is true. That they lived in separate quarters is also a fact. But it is also true that the separate quarters of those broken men disappeared and they became part of the settled tribe and were absorbed in it. That is somewhat strange. The broken men, according to the theory set out before, were given quarters outside the village because they belonged to a different tribe and therefore to different blood. How is it then that they were absorbed by the tribe later on? Why such a thing did not happen in India? These are questions which are natural and which call for an answer. The question is integrally connected with the process of evolution through which primitive society came to be transferred into modern society. As has already been said, this evolution has proceeded along two different lines. One marked the transformation of primitive society from nomadic into a settled community. The other marked the transformation of primitive society from tribal into a territorial community. The question with which we are immediately concerned relates to the second line of evolution, for it is the substitution of common territory for common blood as the bond of union that is responsible for the disappearance of the separate quarters of the broken men. Why did primitive society substitute common territory for common blood as the bond of union? This is a question for which there is no adequate explanation. The origin of the change is very obscure. How the change was brought about is, however, quite clear. 
at some stage there came into being in primitive society a rule whereby a non-tribesman could become a member of the tribe and become absorbed in it as a kindred. It was known as the rule of ennoblement. This rule was that if a non-tribesman lived next to the tribe or married within a tribe for a given number of generations, he became their kindred. Mr. Seabom gives the rules for a non-tribesman becoming a tribesman as it was found in the Welsh village system. 1. Residents in Simru, that is Wales, according to the tradition of South Wales, made the descendant of a stranger at last a Simru, but not until continued to the ration. 2. Intermarriage with innate Simris, generation after generation, made the descendant of a stranger an innate Simru in the fourth generation. In other words, the original stranger's great-grandson, whose blood was at least seven-eighths Simric, was allowed to attain the right to claim the privileged tribesmen. Should not such a thing have happened in India? It could have. Indeed, it should have. For a rule similar to that which existed in Ireland and Wales also existed in India. It is referred to by Manu in chapter 10, verses 64 to 67. He says that a Shudra can be a Brahmin for seven generations if he marries within the Brahmin community. The ordinary rule of Chaturvarnya was that a Shudra could never become a Brahmin. A Shudra was born a Shudra and could not be made a Brahmin. But this rule of antiquity was so strong that Manu had to apply rule of untouchability to the Shudra. It is obvious that if this rule had continued to operate in India, the broken men of India would have been absorbed in the village community and their separate quarters would have ceased to exist. Why did this not happen? The answer is that the notion of untouchability supervened and perpetuated difference between kindred and non-kindred, tribesmen and non-tribesmen in another form, namely between touchables and untouchables. It is this new factor which prevented the amalgamation taking place in the way in which it took place in Ireland and Wales with the result that the system of separate quarters has become a perpetual and a permanent feature.